Um, in the last tune, all we do is talk. In the last lecture, all we do is talk. And there's a little break in the middle where I give a lecture. It's really fun. So, who asked for this DVD? This it was you? All right. I'll just leave it here. It's it, a DVD of some lectures that he missed that aren't yet posted. All right, two. There was a really excellent que there were a couple of really excellent questions in the break. One person said, gee, I don't know how to get started. This is the easiest of all the assignments to get started. How do you get started? Who do, what do you, who do you see? You read the spec and then you... But you've got some people that will help you get started. Who are they? Your group. Yeah, yeah. Instantly go and find your group. Hopefully now, over the next three weeks, or certainly over the next short period of time, your groups are going to be sitting together and you're going to be working together. You guys are like in each other's pockets. If you're not with your members of your group now, find them and get with them. And everyone in the group help everyone else get up to speed. Shh, 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 shh. Because the group sinks or swims together. So your groups have to all look after each other. So yeah, it's an easy start to the assignment because you've got a group to look after you. And the group cares for you. And the group wants you to do well. And, the, and you're all part of a group. Your individual stuff doesn't start till next week. And the other question, it was really good, someone said was, oh, someone said worriedly, but can't I find out what cards have been played? And the answer is, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't mean you couldn't find out what cards have been played. You just can't know the exact sequence they've been played in because that would let someone bypass everything. So you can know all the cards that have been played. There's no worries with that. Absolutely. You can know all the things you need to know to play the game. None of, that, none of that's secret. What you just can't know is you can't be a player who has a photographic memory, who has seen every single card and remembers every single card played and the sequence they're played in. That person doesn't exist in this game. Yeah. Oh, no, this guy in the front first, then you. Yeah. Is there a C function to shuffle an array? Is there a C function to shuffle an array? Oh. Uh, uh, why would you want to? Oh, you could just sort them into order. No, no, they're in chronological order. Yeah, you just sort them into card order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if they were played in card order? If they were played in card order, that, who cares? Because the chance of that's one in n factorial or something. So, yeah. yeah. Well, not, actually, it's much more than that, isn't it? Because they've got to be played in sequence. But anyway, they won't have been played in order. And in fact, that's illegal. Otherwise, oh, no. It could be that someone played four of this, and someone played four of that, and someone played four. It's very unlikely. Yeah. You can have um, a list of cards that have been played in order, just not in the past. Is that correct? If you, you could have a, who knows why you'd want it. I can't think of any advantage, and you'd lose other information by doing this. You could have a list of all the cards played in the order they were played, as long as you didn't know who played them, yeah. which means you'd, say, remove passes or remove random cards or something. So if you destroyed the link between who played a card and what card was played, you could know that information. But that, to me, is throwing away the most important information because you need to know what cards you've played. Otherwise, you're stuffed. You know your initial hand. If you don't know what you've played... <laughs> yeah, so there's got to be some way of finding that out. Now, you could interrogate that within his legal function, but then if you're able to work out what cards you've played and you know the sequence of card plays, then you can probably, ignoring passes, you can probably reconstruct the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but the really good question came from Yusuf, and I can't remember what the question was. Where are you, Yusuf? Wave at me. There. Yeah. What did you ask me? Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I said, it, it can't be that the player gets the whole history of everything that's happened. Yusuf points out, actually, technically, probably that's what the player will be getting. Because if you think about it, the player view is this like type. It's going to be a struct, isn't it, with a, 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 with a pointer pointing to it. And this struct is going to contain a whole lot of information. And it's going to be called a player view. And this struct is literally passed to the player. So the player will have a little box that inside it does contain all the information. That's absolutely fine. What's the restriction? Yusuf, say it in your own words. Yeah. Play of you just can't find that information out. It gets given the box. That box contains every single play in it, probably. But play of you can't ever find that information. The only way play of you can find out what's in the box is with the interface function. And there's no function saying, show me everything in the box. Yep, there's a function saying, how many cards have been played? How many red cards have been played? How many twos have been played? Whatever your functions are. The, the, what's that? The magic eight ball. That's right. It's like an oracle. That's exactly right. You ask it a question. Will I have a happy life? And it goes, try again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> I can't, I can't, I only get one. Gases. Okay. All right, so that was all the good questions that came up during the break, and it was really good to see you guys all talking and thinking. That was a really awesome thing to see. But I did want to show you, what I've done is, um, last night, I rewrote my solution to task two, making Sudoku Grid an ADT. So, and I've published it now in the lecture notes for today. So there's a full implementation of task two as an ADT. So you can copy all the ideas in this when you have to write your own ADT. Let's have a look at it. All right, here's the Sudoku Grid interface. It looks exactly like the interface you guys were given before. This is all in the lecture notes, so it's all visible now. Except we've changed the type def of Sudoku Grid. Do you remember that? Instead of it being, what was it before, an array, it's now a pointer to a struct. Aha! Uh -huh. So the natural question is, and what is that struct? To which the answer is, uh, well done. We're not allowed to know. Yeah, it's not in this file. It's locked away. We can never find out what it is. It's somewhere else. So, we will, anyone getting this file has no clue what the struct is. They just know that it's a struct. All right. Uh, we added one new function called new grid, which makes a new Sudoku grid. Because remember, that was one interesting thing about an ADT. Once we don't know how it's implemented, we can't expect the compiler to set it up on the stack for us um, because maybe the compiler doesn't know enough information to set it up on the stack or maybe setting it up involves some special work. We don't know anymore what it means to set it up. So we'd better have an explicit function to set it up. And the convention we follow is we always say new and the type. So actually, I haven't followed that convention we always follow. Let me now follow the convention we always follow. What it should be called really? New Sudoku grid. There we go. Uh, where is it? Here. Yeah, new Sudoku grid. Shh, shh, shh. So all I've done to the interface is change the type def slightly and change the type of Sudoku grid to make it abstract. And because it's abstract, I changed the name of it to start with a capital letter. So just our way of remembering it's, it's abstract. Everything else is the same. Now, how does main? Oh, yeah. How does, yep. When you start with a capital letter, is that something generally agreed to in the, no. In the science? No. No. That's just us. Oh, uh, oh no, sorry. Start, uh, a, ver a type name starting with a capital letter, meaning an abstract type, is not just us, and it's not the whole world. It's somewhere in between. So, just a union, just so a oh, just, who is it exactly? Just a random scattering. <laughs> a random scattering of people all around the world. Um, basically, in some languages like Java, which you guys are about to see. Oh, Stop that. <laughs> so in, in some languages like Java, which you guys will encounter in uh, second year, um, that's, that's how the classes are created. The classes are created with capital letters. Oh, that's the convention for classes. And they use the same case conventions we're using. So we're sort of doing the way we're doing it now so that when you slip into Java, actually not much going to change because Java looks a lot like C2 and lots of the conventions we're following are Java type conventions. But who else does it? Uh, look, a lot of people in the world uh, do have conventions like that. They use case to mean various things. And it is not an uncommon thing to say that um, type def, your own type definitions always start with a capital letter. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've done the unusual thing, which isn't that unusual, of saying concrete type defs are lowercase. Um, but, but it varies throughout the whole world. The C has been around so long, so many bad programmers have learned it, so many good programmers learned it before they became good programmers, so many people taught it to themselves in 24 hours, so many people think it's for dummies. You know, there's a million people that program in C with a million conventions. And, uh, you know, I poo, poo C a lot, but C is a wonderful language and it's, it's a, like a whole chorus for everyone. It's a fantastic thing. And that's one of the strengths of C. It's really rich and vibrant and lots of people are debating all the time. But certainly in this course, and it's not a bad convention to follow generally. No one would laugh at you or think that was weird. We follow the convention that the uppercase first letter tells you it's an abstract type, which tells you, amongst other things, that when you're passing it, you're passing it by reference. Yes? Uh, C standard libraries just have all lowercase Yeah, like C standard libraries were invented when C was invented, which is like back when the music I like was being written. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, they, wanted to, they didn't even have uppercase keys then, I don't think. C is just all in lowercase. And they didn't have many vowels either. And they had to pay every time they used a vowel. So you'll notice they saved a lot of money that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so let's look at, hit all the questions. Let's look at main. Let's see, I, what I want to do now is see this one change we've made, changing the type, how big an impact does that have on the program? How big an impact do you think it's going to have? Yeah, a couple of lines. It's going to make virtually no impact because of the way the assignment was set up and because of the way I just naturally program, and I hope you guys will too, it actually makes no, virtually no difference at all. Everything continues to work. Let's look at main. How did main change? I tried to comment out the changes so you can see what changed. It used to say Sudoku grid sample. It now says Sudoku grid sample equals new grid. In the old days, I'll make it bigger. Sorry, guys, it's a bit small, isn't it? What's that? Oh, yeah, whoops. Okay, thank you very much. Does that make you feel a bit queasy? Here we go. So it used to just set memory up aside on the stack. Now, it does set memory up on the stack. Sudoku grid sample. What, what memory is being set up on the stack here? What variable is being put up on the stack? Sample is. Yeah, sample is being set up on the stack, and I'm also initializing it. And sample is now, it's not an array, it's a pointer to a struct. So how much memory is being put on the stack? Four bytes, or how much a, a, a pointer is. So, and the pointer, where's that pointing to? It's pointing to an area of memory which is in the heap, which is being set up by new Sudoku grid. So the setup is slightly more elaborate. Everything else doesn't change at all. Nothing here changes, nothing changes. It's all the same. Main's all the same other than that. We just had to set it up slightly differently. And the reason nothing changes is because um, when we pass games in, we we're always passing them in by reference because it was an array. And now we're passing them in by reference because it's an ADT. Um, yeah, I should destroy it when I'm done. But this program creates one of these things and then the program halts. So it will get destroyed automatically. But if I was creating a new Sudoku grid each time, if I was looping and creating new Sudoku grids, then yes, I would have to destroy them. Or during the execution of my program, I'd be cluttering up memory. Now, this will happen in your game. You don't have to worry about it. But in your game, what happens is, for the first move, suppose you're the four players and you're playing in sequence. So you're Black Adder. Congratulations. Sucked in. <laughs> OK. So it doesn't matter, because Baldrick will move up and Black Adder will go down. That's the natural thing. So. Um, uh, what happens is, first of all, the calling function creates a new game, a, a play of you by giving it the play so far. What are the plays so far? Zip. Zip? Nothing? So it gives you a play of you. You pick up the play of you and you decide what move. You tell me what the move is. I make, now an, I make that move and I create a new play of you and I pass it to you. I ask you what your move is. You tell me. I make that move. That updates the history. I make a new play of you with that history and I pass it to you. You tell me your move. I update the history. I make a new play of you, and I give it to you. You tell me your move, which is pass. <laughs> You're and, uh, and then I, I update the play history, and now I make a new one and give it to you. Now, what am I doing every time? I'm making a new play of you every time. If the, play, if the game goes for 50 turns, I've made 50 play of yous. What should I be doing? Destroy. I should go, make a play of you, give it to you. Tell me what your move is. OK, that's a good move. Destroy the play of you. Because no one will ever use that play of you again. He's never going to get, he doesn't get that same one updated all the time. He gets a new one each time. So this is why you don't need any functions that modify the play of you. All your functions on the play of you just have to extract data from it. You don't have to ever change it because it just lives there for a split second then it gets destroyed. It's not permanent. Yes? Um, does your play of you have to have something to like, tell you whose turn it is or is that inherent in the... Oh, does your play of you need to know whose turn it is? I know whose turn it is as I'm creating each thing. If the player would like to know their title, the only way they can find it out is by asking the player of you, but maybe they don't need to know. Maybe they don't care which player they are. Would the player need to query if it is their turn, or is it always their turn? It's always your turn. If you're given a player of you, it's your turn. Okay, so your player of you doesn't have a function that says, okay, whose turn is it? Oh, it could have a function that says whose turn it is, and the answer would always be you. Right. <laughs> yeah. So who is you? Uh, uh, but what's your name? What's your name? Or Richard? <laughs> Your question is, who am I? Who's giving these yeah, yeah, look, we're not even doing philosophy, and someone's already asking, who am I? <laughs> it's like in the first course. It's such a good question. I've given that a lot of thought. I don't know. I mean, who's anyone? No, no. <laughs> I'm being a dick. You're right. You get given a play of you. 
you get given a player view, how do you know you're, you're Black Adder? How do you know your rank? Yeah, how do you know your rank? How do you know that you're Black Adder? Who am I? You, you're giving us out all these. Oh, well, I'm Thurston Software. Okay, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't have to worry about that. Thurston Software always works and <laughs> is wonderful and is not your problem, which is three good things to have combined together. Yeah. If you break Thurston Software, if you break Thurston Software, uh, we, we, you'd have to, I wouldn't want to cross Thurston, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, shh, 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 shh. were there any more questions? Did I see a hand that I forgot to address? Shh. Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah, we do need a destroy here. We didn't put one in the interface. We can get away with it, but we'd better never make more than two or three of these guys, or we'll be wasting memory. Uh, all right. So that's the main function. Now, look. Here's where all the meat is. The real changes happen in the implementation in Sudoku Grid C that you guys wrote. This is where all the changes happen. Let's see what changed. Well, first of all, what's one thing we need to put in there? Definition. A definition of the struct. And here's what it is. It's the one we had in class yesterday. The struct is something called contents, which is an array of 81 elements, each element containing a value. And it's also a, a variable called number occupied, which is an integer, which will tell us how many cells are occupied. Remember, that's the type definition we thought of. We could have done it lots of other ways. Now we've got a whole new function called new grid. So we'd better make it. What does it look like? Well, look, here's how I first made it. Shh, 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 shh. I said, let's have a pointer to a, to a, a, a struct. Let's have a new Sudoku grid, a pointer to a struct. Shh, shh. Hey, there's constant talking. It's fine if you guys talk, because I know you sort of got to, but it's distracting for me. Is there some way you can do it really, really quietly? Or, yeah. I understand why you're doing it. I'm not cross. Um, Sudoku, yeah, okay, so we set up a pointer to a struct here called new. And now we've got this pointer. Where's it currently pointing? What's the contents of Sudoku? What's the contents of new at the moment? Crap, probably. It's probably just a whole lot of crap. And then it's not pointing anywhere, or it's pointing to a random spot. And then we do this new equals malloc. Blah, blah, blah. Well, let's have a look at this malloc. Blah, blah, blah. Malik says, give me some memory. And what you tell it in size is how many bytes of memory you want. How many bytes do I want? Well, I need enough memory to put a struct Sudoku grid in. How big is a struct Sudoku grid? Well, I could work it out. But why don't I let C work it out for me? It's size of struct Sudoku grid. So that's how many bytes I want. So new, so this sets aside that amount of memory in the heap. And it sets new to point to it. So new now points to that piece of memory. Does that make sense? So now new is pointing to an area of memory on the heap. I better check new is not null. Sometimes Malik refuses to give you a pointer to an area of memory. You request some memory, and Malik says, no, nah, I'm giving you a null instead. When would it do that sort of despicable behavior? Yes. When you've run out of memory. Or something bad's happened. It's its way of saying, uh-oh, we're in trouble. So I'm asserting that it didn't return me null. Otherwise, I am actually in a bit of trouble. So, and you always want to do that. You've got to always check after your memory allocations that it did work. Otherwise, new is going to contain um, zero, and then you're going to start to try and write to address zero or offsets from address zero. And you could start on some processes that don't protect low values of memory. You could start overriding really important things like software and all sorts of crazy stuff. In fact, there are attacks that rely on this exactly. Yes, overflowing memory and then knowing where you're going to get the pointer to. Yes. Oh, do you have to hash include? Oh, I should say, I discovered, to my surprise, you have to hash include studlib.h, or well, you don't always get malloc. The compiler I was using, first of all, just had malloc. I guess, I guess the compiler I just had automatically was including studlib.h or something. I'm not sure. But yeah, include studlib.h to get malloc. If you don't have malloc, you'll get a message. And it'll say, it won't say what's this malloc thing, because C obligingly always tries to work out what you're doing wrong and fix it up for you. So C will see, oh, Rich is talking about malloc. I wonder what that is. It's got some brackets around it. It must be a function. He's never defined that function before. He's never told me to look in a library. He never makes mistakes. So I think what it must be is he must be talking about a new function that he hasn't yet written. And I will guess what its type signature is. And if C ever has to guess what a type signature of a function is, it always guesses it returns an int. 
So it thinks, I reckon Malik's something that returns an int. That's what I'm going to guess. And then it goes, new equals Malik. What? That fool Richard, that new function he's about to make that's going to return an int, he's made a mistake because he thinks it's returning a pointer to a struct. I'll give him a helpful error message. And it says, <laughs> Malik um, has an incorrect implicit definition or attempt to convert pointer to struct, uh, int, or something, you know, into, it'll just give some crazy message. And what that, try it so you know what that crazy message is. And whenever you see that crazy message, do this, slash includes did lib.h. And now it knows what malloc is and it uses the right type definition for it. Okay. What's that? Does that null symbol come along with it? Yeah, you get null for free. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, null, So the allocations worked here. Now, there's one piece of, syn I like the number of, the amount of syntax we're reducing, introducing in each lecture is reduced. I like that. Today, there's one piece of syntax to reduce. I'm going to have two things here. I'm going to have type def um, node. Oh, that's not how you write type defs. Type def struct um, node is a node. And then I'm going to say type def uh, uh, node star node pointer. A standard abbreviation, PTR, people normally think it means pointer. It's crap to use abbreviations, but that's one that's so standard you can get away with it and people know what you mean. Okay, so I've created two types here. I've created a type called node that is a struct. Whenever I say node, I just mean this struct. I haven't yet defined the struct. I better not forget to do that. And I've created another type called node pointer that is a pointer to a node. And remember the game we play? We look at this expression here. Node pointer, what it points to. Node pointer, what it points to is a node. So if what node pointer points to is a node, then node pointer is a pointer to a node. Yeah. Cra crazy man, crazy man. We do all that because C doesn't really want us to write this. Node pointer is a pointer to a node. No, no, it doesn't like that. I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't mind it, but this is the game we play. So we've got two types, a node and a node pointer. Does everyone make sense? And let's suppose a node is defined, uh, stru the struct it points to is this. Struct node, what's our struct going to contain? And yeah, we've got a struct to contain an int. It's the most pointless thing in the world. Let's do that. Because we could have just had an int, but let's have a struct that contains an int. We could even have an empty struct. Are you allowed to have empty structs? Has anyone ever? You're not allowed to? What a pity, because that'd be cool. You had a whole type that was a struct that contained nothing. That's like, okay. All right, so we've got int, um, and let's give the int a really bad name as well, x. Okay. <laughs> let's not even initialize it. Let's just leave it as rubbish. Let's just, it's just, uh, okay, so here we go. Let's look what happens. When C sees this line here, oh, uh, and then I'm going to keep my program going. And I'm going to say node n, node ptr, np. Terrible variable names. OK. Tell me, what is n? It's a struct. So what does it actually look like? It's a piece of memory that contains what? And a piece of memory that contains an n. So n, this is n. n is a piece of memory that contains an int. And the int is called x. Oh, let's give it a better name. Int, um, what, what are we storing? I. <laughs> int, this is um, the, the cost of something. It's an integer cost. So this contains an int in here. How much a node costs? Yeah, how much a node costs? What's NP? NP is a pointer. At the moment, it's pointing to rubbish. What if I said down here, uh, I'm going to keep the program going up here. What if I said NP equals, how am I going to get it to point to the node? 
Star? Yeah, yeah, yeah. NP contains the address of... Okay, you got me. I haven't been practicing. Okay. So what's happening now is if N is stored at address 100 and NP is stored at address 104, then the contents of NP are now what? 100. Okay, so NP points to no. All right, here's the structure we've got set up. Now, what if I wanted to store, I wanted to say the cost was 42. Give me a line of code that's going to, we're going to see, there's a whole lot of ways now we can store 42 in here. Let's see all the different ways there are. What's one way of putting 42 in there, the easiest one? N. That's right. N dot cost equals 42. We can do that. N is a struct. Dot cost means I'm talking about the cost part of the struct. That's the only part of the struct. And we're setting it to 42. So that's going to write 42 in here. All right, now I want to write 43 in there. How can I do that in a different way? Okay, now this is what we'd like to do. Yeah, I'm going to need brackets. This is what I'd like to do. Yeah, the thing that NP points to, find the cost part and set it to 43. That's what I want to do. But C, I'm doing two things here. I'm applying this operator and I'm doing this. And C, unfortunately, does them not in the order I want. So it, first of all, thinks, I'll get np.cost. C does this. What's np.cost? That's 42. Star 42 is the memory cell number 42. So it tries to write 43 in memory cell number 42. Well, and that's probably going to kick up all sorts of errors and everyone's going to be unhappy and it's not very good. What I really wanted, how did I want the brackets to go? I really wanted the brackets to go like this, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really wanted to say, take NP, take what it points to, okay, it's a struct, go to the cost part, systematically boring, bit, and assign it to 43. That would work. But C programmers look at this and think, what? Because C programmers are always dealing with pointers to structs rather than structs. I mean, you're going to see that in our course, aren't you? With all our ADTs, they're always going to be pointers to structs. So we're going to have pointers to structs coming out of our ears, and we're going to have to write lines of gibberish like this. It looks like, it looks like an emoticon, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't look like an actual line of code. So it's too much punctuation to be doing something so simple. So C, either at this point, could have thought, I'm going to fall on my sword and we'll have a new language that's much simpler, or let's add some new syntax that does exactly what our existing syntax does with slightly less brackets. And they thought, let's just add some more syntax. So there's a third way of doing it. If I wanted to write 44 to there, I could do this. NP minus greater than cost equals 44. Oh, man. So if you've got a pointer to a, a, a struct, use this symbol and you can dereference it. If you've got a struct directly, use a dot and you can dereference it. And if you just like typing, you can do this and dereference it. They all do the same thing. Has everyone got it? It is going to be your biggest, most common error that you're always going to be putting dots instead of arrows and arrows instead of dots. And rather than just alternating between the two till the compiler doesn't give an error message, I suggest you look at it really closely and fix in your brain, burn in your brain, which is the right one to do. Okay, oh, we're a quarter past. Oh, well, we're nearly finished. Let me just finish and then we'll do the extension lecture. Because I have a real extension lecture today. We're nearly finished. I did all of that so you could understand what this line does. Oh no, so you could understand what this line does. Remember our, shh, guys, come on. Why is everyone talking? You're excited? You miss me. Oh man. That's very nice. Um, okay, um, you've thrown me now. Uh, you, you didn't miss Malcolm. I was watching the video. Someone got him right in the nose. <laughs> From the back, he claims. I think that was awesome. Whoever did that, I hope you're an aeronautical engineer or something, because I'm so impressed. And I expect to see a spinning card vehicle very soon. All right, um, so remember our struct that's representing a... Um, 
a Sudoku grid contains the grid, contains all the numbers, which we call in the contents, the old array, and it's also containing a single integer that tells us how many cells are, are occupied. And that integer is called number occupied. We're setting it to zero. So what we're doing in this code here that's creating a new grid is we're being nice, actually. Initially, I didn't do this, and then later on I thought I should. We're actually initializing it all to zero and clearing it and just doing all the nice housekeeping. So we, we've created the thing and we're giving it sensible starting values. So that's a good thing to do. So we say initially, well, there's nothing occupied in the grid. And then we're going to loop through the whole grid and we get every of the content cells and we set it to empty value. So this clears the entire thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what our new grid does. That's probably the major change. Let's look at the other changes. They're all very minor. Read grid. I used to... I used to write values directly into... Here's what I used to say. I haven't got the code here. I did this because you didn't have your solutions written yet and I wanted to work even if you didn't. So rather than calling your own code, I used to say this. I used to say uh, game angle bracket current equals in char. So we used to when we're reading in a grid, when we're reading in a grid, I used to write it directly into the array. But I rewrote the function, though I didn't have to, I'd still be allowed to rewrite it directly into the array, though I'd now have to use that arrow notation to do it. But I rewrote it, how, how did I get it written into the array now? What did I use? Set cell. I use set cell because although it's an extra function call, so it's a bit of a waste of time, it's, but it's only happening in the beginning, so that's irrelevant in the big scheme of things. I use set cell because then my logic for setting a cell has to only be put in one spot. If there's only one piece of code that ever writes to the array, then all the painful stuff about asserting that the bounds are right and the contents are right and all that sort of stuff, I can do that in one spot instead of repeating it over and over again. So I called set cell. I used an interface function rather than writing it directly. And that let me kill these asserts here. Oh, this assert here. That's the only change I made to read cell. Show game, I did the same thing. Before, I used to print out the contents of the array. But now, I print out the value returned by get cell. So rather than accessing the array directly, I use an interface function. And again, that lets me centralize all the logic to do with accessing the array into one spot, which is slightly convenient. Here's the old is full. Remember, it used to scan through the whole array. Here's the new is full. It's much easier. All I've got to see is the number occupied equal to the size of the grid. If it is, it's full. Because remember, we're keeping this count that tells us how many are occupied. Get free cell. Uh, ooh, what changed here? Uh, nothing. Set cell. What changed here? Oh, whenever we set a cell, I had to update number occupied if we were erasing a previously vacant cell. Get cell. Did nothing change. Clear cell. Uh, oh, yeah, clear cell. If the cell previously wasn't clear and is now being cleared, I had to decrease the number occupied. Is legal, doesn't change, nothing else changes. Okay, so there's just like a few lines of code that changed and the whole thing now is an ADT. Does that make sense to everyone? So that code's on the web, so when you're coding your player view, just go and look at that code. If you can't quite work out how to code up a, an, a, an abstract type, and just uh, use the same way that we put the pointer to the struct in the dot h and the definition of the struct in the dot c. All right, well, good luck, everyone. Um, we're going to take a pause now. In five minutes' time, we'll resume with an extension lecture where I'll be talking about secret writing and uh, cryptography. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, good luck with your assignment, and uh, I hope you submit wonderful things on Sunday. All right. You know, for the brownie point for this week's lab, yes. Yes. right, to have almost infinite amounts of space or whatever until. Yes. Right? Yes. I, 